Section zero of four and twenty fairy tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason in Panama. Preface by James Planchet. The success attending the publication of a new translation of the fairy tales of the Countess d'Aulnoy has justified the publishers in believing that an equally faithful version of some of the most popular stories of her contemporaries and immediate successors similarly annotated might meet with as favourable a reception i have therefore selected twenty-four of the best fairy tales according to my judgment remaining in the cabinet de fées commencing with those of charles perrault the earliest and terminating with some of madame le prince de beaumont the latest french writer of european celebrity in that particular class of literature independently of the fact that with the exception of those of madame de beaumont few if any in the present volume have ever been placed in their integrity before the english reader i trust that the chronological order i have observed in their arrangement will give them a novel interest in the eyes of those children of a larger growth who are not ashamed to confess with la fontaine si pour mes trois comtés j'y prendrai un plaisir extrême or with the great reformer martin luther i would not for any quantity of gold part with the wonderful tales which i have retained from my earliest childhood or have met with in my progress through life the reader will by this arrangement observe in a clearer way than probably he has yet had an opportunity of doing the rise progress and decline of the genuine fairy tale so thoroughly french in its origin so specially connected with the age of that grand monarch whose reign presents us in the graphic pages of saint simon and d'anjou with innumerable pictures of manners and customs dresses and entertainments the singularity magnificence profusion and extent of which scarcely require the fancy of a dull noy to render fabulous in my introduction to the tales of that lively and ingenious lady i have already shown the progress of the popularity of this class of composition but in the present volume it will be seen how in the course of little more than half a century the fairy tale from a fresh sparkling simple yet arch version of a legend as old as the monuments of that celtic race by whom they were introduced into gaul became first elaborated into a novel comprising an ingenious plot with an amusing exaggeration of the manners of the period next inflated into a preposterous and purposeless caricature of its own peculiarities and finally denuded of its sportive fancy its latent humour and its gorgeous extravagance subsided into the dull commonplace moral story which taking less hold of the youthful imagination was however laudable in its intention a very ineffective substitute for the merry monitors it vainly endeavoured to supersede too much like a lesson for the child it was too childish for the man the fairies were dismissed in consequence of the incapacity of the writers to employ them but they were not meant to be annihilated they still live in their own land to laugh at those mortals who will not laugh with them and learn while they laugh modern art may vainly invoke them to perform fresh marvels but enough power still exists in their old spells to enchant youth amuse manhood and resuscitate age and despite the hypercritic and the purest they will continue to exercise their magic influence over the human mind so long as it is capable of appreciating wit fancy and good feeling as mademoiselle l'heritier wrote two hundred years ago ils ne sont pas assez à croire mais tant que dans le monde on verra des enfants des mères et des mères grandes on en gardera la mémoire End of section zero. Section 1 of Four and Twenty Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Bluebeard 
by Charles Perrault, translated by James Planchet. Once on a time, there was a man who had fine town and country houses, gold and silver plate, embroidered furniture, and coaches gilt all over. But unfortunately, this man had a blue beard, which made him look so ugly and terrible that there was not a woman or girl who did not run away from him. One of his neighbors, a lady of quality, had two daughters, who were perfectly beautiful. He proposed to marry one of them, leaving her to choose which of the two she would give him. Neither of them would have him, and they sent him from one to the other, not being able to make up their minds to marry a man who had a blue beard. What increased their distaste to him was that he had had several wives already, and nobody knew what had become of them. Bluebeard, in order to cultivate their acquaintance, took them with their mother, three or four of their most intimate friends, and some young persons who resided in the neighborhood, to one of his country seats, where they passed an entire week. Nothing was thought of but excursions, hunting and fishing, parties, balls, entertainments, collations. Nobody went to bed. The whole night was spent in merry games and gambles. In short, all went off so well that the youngest daughter began to find out that the beard of the master of the house was not as blue as it used to be and that he was a very worthy man. Immediately upon their return to town, the marriage took place. At the end of a month, Bluebeard told his wife that he was obliged to take a journey, which would occupy six weeks at least, on a matter of great consequence, that he entreated she would amuse herself as much as she could during his absence, that she would invite her best friends take them into the country with her if she pleased, and keep an excellent table everywhere. Here, said he to her, are the keys of my two great storerooms. These are those of the chests in which the gold and silver plate is kept that is only used on particular occasions. These are the keys of the strong boxes in which I keep my money. These open the caskets that contain my jewels, and this is the pass-key of all the apartments. As for this little key, it is that of the closet at the end of the long gallery on the ground floor. Open everything and go everywhere, except into that little closet, which I forbid you to enter, and I forbid you so strictly that if you should venture to open the door, there is nothing that you may not have to dread from my anger. She promised to observe implicitly all his directions, and after he had embraced her, he got into his coach and set out on his journey. The neighbors and friends of the young bride did not wait for her invitation, so eager were they to see all the treasures contained in the mansion, not having ventured to enter it while the husband was at home, so terrified were they at his blue beard. Behold them immediately running through all the rooms, closets, and wardrobes, each apartment exceeding the other in beauty and richness. They ascended afterwards to the storerooms, where they could not sufficiently admire the number and elegance of the tapestries, the beds, the sofas, the cabinets, the stands, the tables, and the mirrors, in which they could see themselves from head to foot, and that had frames some of glass, some of silver, and some of gilt metal, more beautiful and magnificent than had ever been seen. They never ceased enlarging upon and envying the good fortune of their friend, who, in the meanwhile, was not in the least entertained by the sight of all these treasures, in consequence of her impatience to open the closet on the ground floor. Her curiosity increased to such a degree that, without reflecting how rude it was to leave her company, 
she ran down a back staircase in such haste that twice or thrice she narrowly escaped breaking her neck. Arrived at the door of the closet, she paused for a moment, bethinking herself of her husband's prohibition, and that some misfortune might befall her for her disobedience. But the temptation was so strong that she could not conquer it. She therefore took the little key and opened, tremblingly, the door of the closet. At first she could discern nothing, the windows being closed. After a short time, she began to perceive that the floor was all covered with clotted blood, in which were reflected the dead bodies of several females suspended against the walls. These were all the wives of Bluebeard, who had cut their throats one after the other. She was ready to die with fright, and the key of the closet, which she had withdrawn from the lock, fell from her hand. After recovering her senses a little, she picked up the key, locked the door again, and went up to her chamber to compose herself. But she could not succeed, so greatly was she agitated. Having observed that the key of the closet was stained with blood, she wiped it two or three times, but the blood would not come off. In vain she washed it and even scrubbed it with sand and freestone. The blood was still there, for the key was enchanted, and there were no means of cleaning it completely. When the blood was washed off one side, it came back on the other. Bluebeard returned that very evening, and said that he had received letters on the road informing him that the business on which he was going had been settled to his advantage. His wife did all she could to persuade him that she was delighted at his speedy return. The next morning he asked her for his keys again. She gave them to him, but her hand trembled so that he had not much difficulty in guessing what had occurred. "'How comes it,' said he, "'that the key of the closet is not with the others?' "'I must have left it,' she replied, "'upstairs on my table.' "'Fail not,' said Bluebeard, "'to give it me presently.' After several excuses, she was compelled to produce the key. Bluebeard, having examined it, said to his wife, Why is there some blood on this key? I don't know, answered the poor wife, paler than death. You don't know, rejoined Bluebeard. I know well enough. You must needs enter the closet. Well, madame, you shall enter it and go take your place amongst the ladies you saw there. She flung herself at her husband's feet, weeping and begging his pardon, with all the signs of true repentance for having disobeyed him. Her beauty and affliction might have melted a rock, but Bluebeard had a heart harder than a rock. "'You must die, madame,' said he, "'and immediately.' "'If I must die,' she replied, looking at him with streaming eyes. Give me a little time to say my prayers. I give you half a quarter of an hour, answered Bluebeard, but not a minute more. As soon as he had left her, she called her sister and said to her, Sister Anne, for so she was named, go up, I pray thee, to the top of the tower, and see if my brothers are not coming. They have promised me that they would come to see me today, and if you see them, sign to them to make haste. Sister Anne mounted to the top of the tower, and the poor distressed creature called to her every now and then, Anne, Sister Anne, dost thou not see anything coming? And Sister Anne answered her, I see nothing but the sun making dust and the grass growing green. In the meanwhile, Bluebeard 
with a great cutlass in his hand, called out with all his might to his wife, Come down quickly, or I will come up there. One minute more, if you please, replied his wife, and immediately repeated in a low voice, Anne, sister Anne, dost thou not see anything coming? And sister Anne replied, I see nothing but the sun making dust and the grass growing green. Come down quickly, roared Bluebeard, or I will come up there. I come, answered his wife, and then exclaimed, Anne, sister Anne, dost thou not see anything coming? I see, said sister Anne, a great cloud of dust moving this way. Is it my brother's? Alas, no, sister, I see a flock of sheep. Wilt thou not come down? shouted Bluebeard. One minute more, replied his wife, and then she cried, Anne, sister Anne, dost thou not see anything coming? I see, she replied, two horsemen coming this way, but they are still at a great distance. Heaven be praised, she exclaimed a moment afterwards. They are my brothers. I am making all the signs I can to hasten them. Bluebeard began to roar so loudly that the whole house shook again. The poor wife descended and went and threw herself with streaming eyes and dishevelled tresses at his feet. It is of no use, said Bluebeard. You must die. Then seizing her by the hair with one hand and raising his cutlass with the other, he was about to cut off her head. The poor wife turned towards him and fixing upon him her dying eyes, implored him to allow her one short moment to collect herself. No, no, said he, recommend thyself heartily to heaven. And lifting his arm, at this moment there was so loud a knocking at the gate that Bluebeard stopped short. It was opened, and two horsemen were immediately seen to enter, who, drawing their swords, ran straight at Bluebeard. He recognized them as the brothers of his wife, one a dragoon, the other a musketeer, and, consequently, fled immediately in hope to escape. But they pursued him so closely that they overtook him before he could reach the step of his door, and, passing their swords through his body, left him dead on the spot. The poor wife was almost as dead as her husband, and had not strength to rise and embrace her brothers. It was found that Bluebeard had no heirs, and so his widow remained possessed of all his property. She employed part of it in marrying her sister Anne to a young gentleman who had long loved her, another part in buying captain's commissions for her two brothers, and with the rest she married herself to a very worthy man, who made her forget the miserable time she had passed with Bluebeard. Provided one has common sense, and of the world but knows the ways, this story bears the evidence of being one of bygone days. No husband now is so terrific, impossibilities expecting. Though jealous, he is still pacific, indifference to his wife affecting. And of his beard, whatever hue, his spouse need fear no such disaster. Indeed, twould often puzzle you to say which of the twain is master. End of section one. Recording by Ezwa in Belgium in May 2017. Section two of four and twenty fairy tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Sleeping Beauty in the Wood by Charles Perrault. Translated by James Planchet. The Sleeping Beauty in the Wood. Once upon a time, there was a king and a queen 
who were so vexed at not having any children, so vexed that one cannot express it. They visited all the baths in the world, vows, pilgrimages, everything was tried, and nothing succeeded. At length, however, the queen was brought to bed of a daughter. There was a splendid christening, for godmothers they gave the young princess all the fairies they could find in the country. They found seven, in order that each making her a gift, according to the custom of fairies in those days. The princess, by these means, became possessed of all imaginable perfections. After the baptismal ceremonies, all the company returned to the king's palace, where a great banquet was set out for the fairies. Covers were laid for each, consisting of a magnificent plate with a massive gold case, containing a spoon, a fork, and a knife of fine gold, enriched with diamonds and rubies. But as they were all taking their places at the table, there was seen to enter an old fairy, who had not been invited, because for upwards of fifty years she had never quitted the tower she resided in, and it was supposed she was neither dead or enchanted. The king ordered a cover to be laid for her, but there was no possibility of giving her a massive gold case, such as the others had, because there had been only seven made expressly for the seven fairies. The old lady thought she was treated with contempt, and muttered some threats between her teeth. One of the young fairies, who chanced to be near her, overheard her, and imagining she might cast some misfortune on the little princess, went as soon as they rose from table, and hid herself behind the hangings, in order to have the last word, and be able to repair, as fast as possible, any mischief the old woman might do. In the meanwhile, the fairies began to endow the princess. The youngest, as her gift, decreed that she should be the most beautiful person in the world. The next fairy, that she should have the mind of an angel. The third, that she should evince the most admirable grace in all she did. The fourth, that she should dance to perfection. The fifth, that she should sing like a nightingale and the sixth, that she should play on every instrument in the most exquisite manner possible. The turn of the old fairy having arrived, she declared, while her hand shook more with malice than with age, that the princess should pierce her hand with a spindle and die of the wound. This terrible fate made all the company tremble, and there was not one of them who could refrain from tears. At this moment, the young fairy issued from behind the tapestry and uttered aloud these words, Comfort yourselves, king and queen, your daughter shall not die of it. It is true that I have not sufficient power to undo entirely what my elder has done. The princess will pierce her hand with a spindle, but instead of dying, she will only fall into a deep slumber, which will last one hundred years at the end of which a king's son will come to wake her. The king, in hope of avoiding the misfortune predicted by the old fairy, immediately caused an edict to be published, by which he forbade any one to spin with a spindle, or to have spindles in their possession under pain of death. At the end of fifteen or sixteen years, the king and queen being absent at one of their country residences, it happened that the princess, while running one day about the castle, and from one chamber up to another, arrived at the top of the tower, and entered a little garret, where an honest old woman was sitting by herself, spinning with her distaff and spindle. This good woman had never heard of the king's prohibition with respect to spinning with a spindle, "'What are you doing there?' asked the princess. "'I am spinning, my fair child,' answered the old woman, who did not know her. "'Oh, how pretty it is,' rejoined the princess. "'How do you do it? Give it to me, 
that I may see if I can do it as well. She had no sooner taken hold of the spindle than, being very hasty, a little thoughtless, and moreover, the sentence of the fairies so ordaining it, she pierced her hand with the point of it, and fainted away. The good old woman, greatly embarrassed, called for help. People came from all quarters. They threw water in the princess's face. They unlaced her stays. They slapped her hands. They rubbed her temples with Queen of Hungary's water, but nothing could bring her to. Footnote. Queen of Hungary's Water. A celebrated disillusion of spirit of wine upon rosemary, so called from the receipt purporting to have been written by a Queen Elizabeth of Hungary, and first published at Frankfurt in 1659. End footnote. The king, who had run upstairs at the noise, then remembered the prediction of the fairies, and wisely concluding that this must have occurred as the fairies had said it would, had the princess conveyed into the finest apartment in the palace, and placed on a bed of gold and silver embroidery. One would have said she was an angel, so lovely did she appear, for her swoon had not deprived her of her rich complexion. Her cheeks preserved their crimson, and her lips were like coral. Her eyes were closed, but they could hear her breathe softly, which showed that she was not dead. The king commanded them to let her repose in peace until the hour arrived for her waking. The good fairy, who had saved her life by decreeing that she should sleep for a hundred years, was in the kingdom of Mataquin, twelve thousand leagues off, when the princess met with her accident. But she was informed of it instantly by a little dwarf, who had a pair of seven-league boots, that is, boots which enabled the wearer to take seven leagues at a stride. Footnote. From the explanation contained in the parentheses, it is probable that we have here the earliest notion of the celebrated articles in a French story, Jack the Giant Killer and Jack and the Beanstalk, being of English origin. End footnote. The fairy set out immediately, and an hour afterwards they saw her arrive in a fiery chariot, drawn by dragons. The king advanced to hand her out of the chariot. She approved of all he had done, but, as she had great foresight, she considered that, when the princess awoke, she would feel considerably embarrassed at finding herself all alone in that old castle. So this is what the fairy did. She touched with her wand everybody that was in the castle, except the king and queen, governesses, maids of honor, women of the bedchamber, gentlemen, officers, stewards, cooks, scullions, boys, guards, porters, pages, footmen. She touched also the horses that were in the stables, with their grooms, the great mastiffs in the courtyard, and little Poust, the tiny dog of the princess that was on the bed beside her. As soon as she had touched them, they all fell asleep, not to wake again until the time arrived for their mistress to do so, in order that they might be all ready to attend upon her when she should want them. Even the spits that had been put down to the fire, laden with partridges and pheasants, went to sleep, and the fire itself also. All this was done in a moment. The fairies never lost much time over their work, after which the king and queen, having kissed their dear daughter, without waking her, quitted the castle, and issued a proclamation forbidding any person whosoever to approach it. These orders were unnecessary, for in a quarter of an hour there grew up around the park so great a quantity of trees, large and small, of brambles and thorns, interlacing each other, that neither man nor beast could get through them, so that nothing more was to be seen in the tops of the castle turrets, and they only at a considerable distance. Nobody doubted, but that was also some of the fairy's handiwork, in order that the princess might have nothing to fear from the curiosity of strangers during her slumber. At the expiration of a hundred years, the son of the king, 
at that time upon the throne and who was of a different family to that of the sleeping princess having been hunting in that neighborhood inquired what towers they were that he saw above the trees of a very thick wood each person answered him according to the story he had heard some said that it was an old castle haunted by ghosts others that all the witches of those parts held their sabbath in it the more general opinion was that it was the abode of an ogre and that he carried thither all the children he could catch in order to eat them at his leisure and without being pursued having alone the power of making his way through the wood the prince did not know what to believe about it when an old peasant spoke in his turn and said to him prince it is more than fifty years ago since i heard my father say that there was in that castle the most beautiful princess that was ever seen that she was to sleep for a hundred years and would be awakened by a king's son for whom she was reserved the young prince at these words felt himself all on fire he believed without hesitation that he was destined to accomplish this famous adventure and impelled by love and glory resolved to see what would come of it upon the spot scarcely had he approached the wood when all those great trees all those brambles and thorns made way for him to pass of their own accord he walked towards the castle which he saw at the end of a long avenue he had entered and what rather surprised him was that he found none of his people had been allowed to follow him the trees having closed up again as soon as he had passed he continued nevertheless to advance a young and amorous prince is always courageous he entered a large forecourt where everything he saw was calculated to freeze his blood with terror a frightful silence reigned around death seemed everywhere present nothing was to be seen but the bodies of men and animals stretched out apparently lifeless he soon discovered however by the shining noses and red faces of the porters that they were only asleep and their goblets in which still remained a few drops of wine sufficiently approved that they had dozed off whilst drinking he passed through a large courtyard paved with marble he ascended the staircase he entered the guard-room where the guards stood drawn up in line the carbons shouldered and snoring their loudest he traversed several apartments with ladies and gentlemen all asleep some standing others seated he entered a chamber covered with gold and saw on a bed the curtains of which were open on each side the most lovely sight he had ever looked upon a princess who seemed to be about fifteen or sixteen the lustre of whose charms gave her an appearance that was luminous and supernatural he approached trembling and admiring and knelt down beside her at that moment the enchantment being ended the princess awoke and gazed upon the prince with more tenderness than a first sight of him seemed to authorize is it you prince said she you have been long awaited the prince delighted at these words and still more by the tone in which they were uttered knew not how to express to her his joy and gratitude he assured her he loved her better than himself his language was not very coherent but it pleased the more there was little eloquence but a great deal of love he was much more embarrassed than she was and one ought not to be astonished of that the princess had had a time enough to consider what she should say to him for there is reason to believe though history makes no mention of it that during her long nap the good fairy had procured her the pleasure of very agreeable dreams in short they talked for four hours without having said half what they had to say to each other in the meanwhile all the palace had been roused at the same time as the princess everybody remembered their duty and as they were not all in love they were dying with hunger the lady-in-waiting as hungry as any of them became impatient and announced loudly to the princess that the meat was on the table the prince assisted the princess to rise she was full dressed and most magnificently but he took good care not to hint to her 
that she was attired like his grandmother and wore a stand-up collar footnote colette mont the contemporary of the ruff in the reign of louis the fourteenth it was succeeded by the collet rabatu and totally discarded before his decease and footnote she looked however not a morsel the less lovely in it they passed into a hall of mirrors in which they supped attended by the officers of the princess the violins and hautbois played old but excellent pieces of music notwithstanding it was a hundred years since they had been performed by anybody and after supper to lose no time the grand almoner married the royal lovers in the chapel of the castle early next morning the prince returned to the city where his father was in great anxiety about him the prince told him that he had lost himself in the forest whilst hunting and that he had slept in a woodcutter's hut who had given him some black thread and cheese for his supper the king his father who was a simple man believed him but his mother was not so easily satisfied and observing that he went hunting nearly every day and had always some story ready as an excuse when he had slept two or three nights away from home she no longer doubted but that he had some mistress for he lived with the princess for upwards of two years and had two children by her the first which was a girl was named aurora and the second a son was called day because he was still more beautiful than his sister the queen often said to her son in order to draw from him some avowal that he ought to form some attachment but he never ventured to trust her with his secret he feared her although he loved her for she was of the race of ogres and the king had married her only on account of her great wealth it was even whispered about the court that she had the inclinations of an ogress and that when she saw little children passing she had the greatest difficulty in restraining herself from pouncing upon them the prince therefore would never say one word about his adventure on the death of the king however which happened two years afterwards the prince being his own master he made a public declaration of his marriage and went in great state to bring the queen his wife to the palace she made a magnificent entry into the capital with her two children one on each side of her some time afterwards the king went to war with his neighbor the emperor cantalabut he left the regency of the kingdom to the queen his mother earnestly recommending to her care his wife and his children he was likely to be all the summer in the field and as soon as he was gone the queen mother sent her daughter-in-law and the children to a country house in the wood that she might more easily gratify her horrible longing she followed them thither a few days after and said one evening to her maitre de hotel i will eat little aurora for dinner to-morrow oh madame exclaimed the maitre de hotel i will said the queen and she said it in the tone of an ogress longing to eat fresh meat and i will have her served up with sauce robert footnote a sauce picante as ancient as the fifteenth century being one of the seventeen sauces named by Talavant, chief cook to charles the seventh of france in fourteen fifty six and footnote the poor man seeing plainly an ogress was not to be trifled with took his great knife and went up to little aurora's room she was then about four years old and came jumping and laughing to throw her arms about his neck and asked him for sweetmeats he burst into tears the knife fell from his hands and he went down again into the kitchen court and killed a little lamb and served it up with so delicious a sauce that his mistress assured him she had never eaten anything so excellent in the meanwhile he had carried off little aurora and given her to his wife to conceal her in the lodging which she occupied at a further end of the kitchen court a week afterwards the wicked queen said to her maitre d'hotel i will eat little day for supper he made no reply being determined to deceive her as before he went in search of little day and found him with a tiny foil in his hand fencing with a great monkey though he was only three years old he carried him to his wife who hid him 
where she had hidden his sister, and then cooked a very tender little kid in the place of little day, in which the ogress thought wonderfully good. All went well enough so far, but one evening this wicked queen said to the man at the hotel, I would eat the queen with the same sauce that I had with her children. Then, indeed, did the poor maître de l'hôtel despair of being again able to deceive her. The young queen was turned of twenty, without counting the hundred years she had slept. Her skin was a little rough, though it was white and beautiful. Though it was white and beautiful, and where was he to find in a mangeret an animal that would pass for her? He resolved that, to save his own life, he would cut the queen's throat, and went up to her apartment with the determination to execute his purpose at once. He worked himself up into a passion, and entered the young queen's chamber, poniard in hand. He would not, however, take her by surprise, but repeated, very respectfully, the order he had received from the queen mother. Do it, do it, said she, stretching out her neck to him. Obey the order that has been given to you. I shall again behold my children, my poor children, that I love so dearly. She had imagined them to be dead ever since they had been carried off without explanation. No, no, madame, replied the poor maître de l'hôtel, touched to the quick. You shall not die, and you shall see your children again. But it shall be in my own house, where I have hidden them, and I will again deceive the queen mother by serving up to her a young hind in your stead. He led her forthwith to his own apartments, where leaving her to embrace her children and weep with them, he went and cooked a hind, of which the queen ate at her supper with as much appetite as if it had been the young queen. She exulted in her cruelty, and intended to tell the king on his return that some ferocious wolves had devoured the queen his wife and her two children. One evening, that she was prowling, as usual, round the courts and poultry-yards of the castle to inhale the smell of raw flesh, she overheard little day crying in a lower room, because the queen, his mother, was about to whip him for having been naughty, and she also heard little Aurora begging for forgiveness for her brother. The ogress recognized the voices of the queen and her children, and, furious at having been cheated, she gave orders, in a tone that made everybody tremble, that the next morning early there should be brought into the middle of the court a large copper, which she had filled with toads, vipers, adders, and serpents, in order to fling into it the queen, her children, the maître d'hôtel, his wife, and his maidservant. She had commanded that they should be brought thither with hands tied behind them. There they stood, and the executioners were preparing to fling them into the copper, when the king, who was not expected so early, entered the courtyard on horseback. He had ridden post, and in great astonishment inquired what was the meaning of all that horrible spectacle. Nobody dared to tell him when the ogress, enraged at the sight of the king's return, flung herself head foremost into the copper, and was devoured in an instant by the horrid reptiles she had caused it to be filled with. The king could not help being sorry for it. She was his mother, but he speedily consoled himself in the society of his beautiful wife and children. Some time for a husband to wait, who is young, handsome, wealthy, and tender, may not be a hardship too great, for a maid whom love happy would render, but to be for a century bound, to live single, I fancy the number, of beauties but small, would be found, so long who could patiently slumber, to lovers who hate time to waste, and minutes a century's measure, I would hint those who marry in haste may live to repent it at leisure. Yet so ardently onwards they press, and on prudence so gallantly trample, that I haven't the heart, I confess, to urge on them beauty's example. End of section two. Section three of four and twenty fairy tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Betty B. Master Cat or Puss in Boots by Charles Perrault. Translated by James Planchet. A miller bequeathed to his three sons all his worldly goods, which consisted only of his mill, his ass, and his cat. The division was speedily made. Neither notary nor attorney were called in. They would soon have eaten up all the little patrimony. The eldest had the mill, the second son the ass, and the youngest had nothing but the cat. The latter was disconsolate at inheriting so poor a portion. My brother, said he, may earn an honest livelihood by entering into partnership but as for me when i have eaten my cat and made a muff of his skin i must die of hunger the cat who had heard this speech but without appearing to do so said to him with a sedate and serious air do not afflict yourself master you have only to give me a bag and get a pair of boots made for me to go amongst the bushes in and you will see that you are not so badly left as you believe though the cat's master did not place much confidence in this assertion he had seen him play such cunning tricks in catching rats and mice when he would hang himself up by the heels or lie in the flower as if he were dead that he was not altogether hopeless of being assisted by him in his distress as soon as the cat had what he asked for he pulled on his boots boldly and hanging the bag round his neck he took the strings of it in his forepaws and went into a warren where there were a great number of rabbits he put some bran and some sow thistles in his bag and stretching himself out as if he were dead he waited till some young rabbit little versed in the wiles of the world should come and ensconce himself in the bag in order to eat what he had put into it he had hardly laid down before he was gratified a young scatterbrain of a rabbit entered the bag and master cat instantly pulling the strings caught it and killed it without mercy proud of his prey he went to the king's palace and demanded an audience he was ushered up to his majesty's apartment into which having entered he made a low bow to the king and said to him sire here is a wild rabbit which my lord the marquis de carabas such was the name he took a fancy to give to his master has ordered me to present with his duty to your master tell your master replied the king that i thank him and that he has given me great pleasure another day he went and hid himself in the wheat holding the mouth of his bag open as usual and as soon as a brace of partridges entered it he pulled the strings and took them both he went immediately and presented them to the king in the same way that he had the wild rabbit the king received with equal gratification the brace of partridges and gave him something to drink his health the cat continued in this manner during two or three months to carry to the king every now and then presents of game from his master one day when he knew the king was going to drive on the banks of the river with his daughter the most beautiful princess in the world he said to his master if you will follow my advice your fortune is made you have only to go and bathe in a part of the river i will point out to you and leave the rest to me the marquis de carabas did as his cat advised him without knowing what good would come of it while he was bathing the king passed by and the cat began to shout with all his might help help my lord the marquis de carabas is drowning at this cry the king looked out of the coach window and recognizing the cat who had so often brought game to him ordered his guards to fly to the help of my lord the marquis de carabas whilst they were getting the poor marquis out of the river the cat approaching the royal coach told the king that during the time his master was bathing some robbers had come and carried off his clothes although he had called thieves as loud as he could the rogue had hidden them himself under a great stone the king immediately ordered the officers of his wardrobe to go and fetch one of his handsomest suits for my lord the marquis de carabas the king embraced him a thousand times and as the fine clothes they dressed him in set off his good looks for he was handsome and well made the king's daughter found him much to her taste and the marquis de carabas had no sooner cast upon her two or three respectful and rather tender glances than she fell desperately in love with him 
the king insisted upon his getting into the coach and accompanying them in their drive the cat enchanted to see that his scheme began to succeed ran on before and having met with some peasants who were mowing a meadow said to them you good people who are mowing here if you do not tell the king that the meadow you are mowing belongs to my lord the marquis de carabas you shall be all cut into pieces as small as minced meat the king failed not to ask the mowers whose meadow it was they were mowing it belongs to my lord the marquis de carabas said they all together for the cat's threat had frightened them you perceive sire rejoined the marquis it is a meadow which yields an abundant crop every year master cat who kept in advance of the party came up to some reapers and said to them you good people who are reaping if you do not say that all this corn belongs to my lord the marquis de carabas you shall be all cut into pieces as small as minced meat the king who passed by a minute afterwards wished to know to whom all those cornfields belonged that he saw there to my lord the marquis de carabas repeated the reapers and the king again wished the marquis joy of his property the cat who ran before the coach uttered the same threat to all he met and the king was astonished at the great wealth of my lord the marquis de carabas master cat at length arrived at a fine chateau the owner of which was an ogre the richest that was ever known for all through the lands through which the king had driven were held of the lord of this chateau the cat took care to inquire who the ogre was and what he was able to do and then requested to speak with him saying that he would not pass so near his chateau without doing himself the honour of paying his respects to him the ogre received him as civilly as an ogre could and made him sit down they assure me said the cat that you possess the power of changing yourself into all sorts of animals that you could for instance transform yourself into a lion or an elephant tis true said the ogre brusquely and to prove it to you you shall see me become a lion the cat was so frightened at seeing a lion before him that he immediately scampered up into the gutter not without trouble and danger on account of his boots which were not fit to walk on the tiles with a short time afterwards the cat having perceived that the ogre had resumed his previous form descended and admitted that he had been terribly frightened they assure me besides said the cat but i cannot believe it that you have also the power to assume the form of the smallest animal for instance to change yourself into a rat or a mouse i confess to you i hold that to be utterly impossible impossible replied the ogre you shall see and immediately changed himself into a mouse which began to run about the floor the cat no sooner caught sight of it than he pounced upon and devoured it in the meanwhile the king who saw from the road the fine chateau of the ogre desired to enter it the cat who heard the noise of the coach rolling over the drawbridge ran to meet it and said to the king your majesty is welcome to the chateau of my lord the marquis de carabas how my lord marquis exclaimed the king this chateau also belongs to you nothing can be finer than this courtyard and all these buildings that surround it let us see the inside of it if you please the marquis handed out the young princess and following the king who led the way upstairs entered a grand hall where they found a magnificent collation which the ogre had ordered to be prepared for some friends who were to have visited him that very day but who did not presume to enter when they found the king was there the king as much enchanted by the accomplishments of my lord the marquis de carabas as his daughter who doted upon him and seeing the great wealth he possessed said to him after having drunk five or six bumpers it depends entirely on yourself my lord marquis whether or not you become my son-in-law the marquis making several profound bows accepted the honour the king offered him and on the same day was united to the princess the cat became a great lord and never again ran after mice except for his amusement be the advantage ne'er so great of owning a superb estate from sire to son descended young men oft find on industry combined with ingenuity they'd better have depended if the son of a miller so quickly could gain 
the heart of a princess it seems pretty plain with good looks and good manners and some aid from dress the humblest need not quite despair of success End of section 3section four of four and twenty fairy tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. cinderella or the little glass slipper by charles perrault translated by james planchet cinderella or the little glass slipper once on a time there was a gentleman who took for a second wife the haughtiest and proudest woman that had ever been seen she had two daughters of the same temper and who resembled her and everything the husband on his side had a daughter but whose gentleness and goodness were without parallel she inherited them from her mother who was the best creature in the world the wedding was hardly over before the stepmother's ill humor broke out she could not abide the young girl whose good qualities made her own daughters appear more detestable she employed her in all the meanest work of the house it was she who cleaned the plate and the stairs who scrubbed madame's chamber and those of mademoiselle's her daughters she slept at the top of the house in a loft on a wretched straw mattress while her sisters occupied rooms beautifully floored in which were the most fashionable beds and the mirrors wherein they could see themselves from head to foot the poor girl bore everything with patience and did not dare complain to her father who would only have scolded her as his wife governed him entirely when she had done her work she went and placed herself in the chimney corner and sat down amongst the cinders which caused her to be called by the household in general cinder tail the second daughter however who was not so rude as her elder sister called her cinderella notwithstanding cinderella in her shabby clothes looked a thousand times handsomer than her sisters however magnificently attired it happened that the king's son gave a ball and invited to it all persons of quality our two young ladies were included in the invitation for they cut a grand figure in the neighbourhood behold them in great delight and very busy choosing the most becoming gowns and headdresses a new mortification for cinderella for it was she who ironed her sister's linen and sat their ruffles nothing was talked of but the style in which they were to be dressed i said the eldest will wear my red velvet dress and my english point lacing trimmings i said the youngest shall only wear my usual petticoat but to make up for that i shall put on my gold-flowered mantua and my necklace of diamonds which are none of the poorest they sent for a good milliner who made up their doubled frilled caps and brought their patches of the best maker they called cinderella to give them her opinion for she had excellent taste cinderella gave them the best advice in the world and even offered to dress their heads for them which they were very willing she should do and whilst she was about it they said to her cinderella shouldn't thou like to go to the ball alas mademoiselles you make game of me that would not befit me at all thou art right they would laugh immensely to see a cinder tail at a ball any other but cinderella would have dressed their heads awry but she was good-natured and dressed them to perfection they could eat nothing for nearly two days so transported were they with joy more than a dozen laces were broken in making their waists as small as possible and they were always before their looking-glasses at last the happy day arrived they set off and cinderella followed them with her eyes as long as she could when they were out of sight she began to cry her godmother who saw her all in tears inquired what ailed her i should so like i should so like she sobbed so much that she could not finish the sentence thou wouldst so like to go to the ball 
Is not that it? Alas, yes, said Cinderella, sighing. Well, if thou wilt be a good girl, I will take care thou shall go. She led her into her chamber and said to her, Go into the garden and bring me a pumpkin. Cinderella went immediately, gathered the finest she could find, and brought it to her godmother, unable to guess how the pumpkin could enable her to go to the ball. Her godmother scooped it out, and having nothing left but the rind, stuck it with her wand, and the pumpkin was immediately changed into a beautiful coach, gilt all over. She then went and looked into the mouse trap, where she found six mice all alive. She told Cinderella to lift the door of the mouse trap a little, and to each mouse, as it ran out, she gave a tap with her wand, and the mouse was immediately changed into a fine horse, thereby producing a handsome team of six horses of a beautiful dappled mouse gray color. As she was in some difficulty as to what she should make a coachman of, Cinderella said, I will go and see if there be not a rat in the rat trap. We will make a coachman of him. Thou art right, said her godmother. Go and see. Cinderella brought her the rat trap, in which there were three great rats. The fairy selected one from the three on account of its amble beard, and having touched it, it was changed into a fat coachman who had the finest moustache that ever was seen. She then said, Go into the garden that wilt find there behind the watering pot six lizards bring them to me she had no sooner brought them than the godmother transformed them into six footmen who immediately jumped up behind the coach with their liveries all covered with lace and hung on to it as if they had done nothing else all their lives the fairy then said to cinderella well there is something to go to the ball in art thou not well pleased yes but am I to go in these dirty clothes? Her godmother only touched her with her wand, and in the same instant her dress was changed to cloth of gold and silver, covered with jewels. She then gave her a pair of glass slippers, the prettiest in the world. When she was thus attired, she got into the coach, but her godmother advised her, above all things, not to stay out past midnight, warning her that if she remained at the ball one minute longer, her coach would again become a pumpkin, her horses mice, her footmen lizards, and her clothes resume their old appearance. She promised her godmother she would not fail to leave the ball before midnight, and departed, out of her senses with joy. The king's son, who was informed that a grand princess had arrived whom nobody knew, ran to receive her, he handed her out of the coach, and led her into the hall, where the company was assembled. There was immediately a dead silence. They stopped dancing, and the fiddlers ceased to play. So engrossed was every one in the contemplation of the great attractions of the unknown lady. Nothing was heard but a low murmur of, Oh, how lovely she is! The king himself, old as he was, could not take his eyes from her and observed to the queen that it was a long time since he had seen so beautiful and so amiable a person. All of the ladies were instantly occupied in examining her headdress and her clothes, that they might have some like them the very next day, provided they could find material as beautiful and work people sufficiently clever to make them up. The king's son conducted her to the most honorable seat, and then led her out to dance. She danced with so much grace that their admiration of her was increased. A very grand supper was served, of which the prince ate not a morsel, so absorbed was he in contemplation of her. She seated herself beside her sisters and showed them a thousand civilities. She shared with them the oranges and citrons which the prince had given to her, at which they were much surprised, for she appeared a perfect stranger to them. Whilst they were in conversation together, Cinderella heard the clock strike three quarters past eleven. She immediately made a profound curtsy to the company, 
and departed as quickly as she could. As soon as she had reached home, she went to find her godmother, and after having thanked her, said she much wished to go to the ball again the next day, because the king's son had invited her. While she was occupied in telling her godmother all that had passed at the ball, the two sisters knocked on the door. Cinderella went and opened it. Oh, how late you are, said she to them, yawning, rubbing her eyes, and stretching herself as if she had but just awoke. She had not, however, been inclined to sleep since she had left them. Hast thou been at the ball? said one of her sisters to her. Thou wouldst not have been weary of it. There came to it the most beautiful princess, the most beautiful that ever was seen. She paid us a thousand attentions. She gave us oranges and citrons. Cinderella was beside herself with delight. She asked them the name of the princess, but they replied that nobody knew her, that the king's son was much puzzled about it, and that he would give everything in the world to know who she was. Cinderella smiled and said, She was very handsome then. Heavens, how fortunate you are! Could not I get a sight of her? Alas, Mademoiselle Javot, lend me the yellow gown you wear every day? Oh, truly, said Mademoiselle Javot, I like that. Lend one's gown to a dirty cinder tail like you. I must be very mad indeed. Cinderella fully expected this refusal, and was delighted at it, for she would have been greatly embarrassed if her sister had lent her her gown. The next day, the two sisters went to the ball, and Cinderella also, but still more splendidly dressed than before. The king's son never left her side, or ceased saying tender things to her. The young lady was much amused, and forgot what her godmother had advised her, so that she heard the clock begin to strike twelve, when she did not even think it was eleven. She rose and fled as lightly as a fawn, the prince followed her, but could not overtake her. She dropped one of her glass slippers, which the prince carefully picked up. Cinderella reached home almost breathless, without coach or footman, and in her shabby clothes, nothing having remained of all her finery except one of her little slippers, the fellow of that she let fall. The guards at the palace gate were asked if they had not seen the princess go out. They answered that they had seen no one pass, but a poorly dressed girl who had more the air of a peasant than of a lady. When the two sisters returned from the ball, Cinderella asked them if they had been as much entertained as before, and if the beautiful lady had been present. They said yes, but that she had fled as soon as it had struck twelve, and so precipitately that she had let fall one of her little glass slippers, the prettiest in the world, that the king's son had picked up, that he had done nothing but gaze upon it during the remainder of the evening, and that, undoubtedly, he was very much in love with the beautiful person to whom the little slipper belonged. They spoke the truth, for a few days afterwards the king's son caused it to be proclaimed by sound of trumpet that he would marry her, whose foot would exactly match with the slipper. They began by trying it on the princesses, then on the duchesses, and so on throughout all the court, but in vain. It was taken to the two sisters, who did their utmost to force one of their feet into the slipper, but they could not manage to do so. Cinderella, who witnessed their efforts and recognized the slipper, said laughingly, Let me see if it will not fit me. Her sisters began to laugh and ridicule her. The gentleman, who had been entrusted to try the slipper, having attentively looked at Cinderella and found her to be very handsome, said that it was a very proper request, and that he had been ordered to try the slipper on all girls, without exception. He made Cinderella sit down, and putting the slipper to her little foot, he saw it go on easily and fit like wax. Great was the astonishment of the two sisters, but it was still greater when Cinderella took the other little slipper out of her pocket 
and put it on her other foot. At that moment the godmother arrived, who, having given a tap with her wand to Cinderella's clothes, they became still more magnificent than all the others she had appeared in. The two sisters then recognized in her the beautiful person they had seen at the ball. They threw themselves at her feet to crave her forgiveness for all the ill-treatment she had suffered from them. Cinderella, raised and embracing them, said that she forgave them with all of her heart, and begged them to love her dearly for the future. They conducted her to the young prince, just as she was. He found her handsomer than ever, and a few days afterwards he married her. Cinderella, who was as kind as she was beautiful, gave her sisters apartments in the palace, and married them the very same day to two great lords of the court. Beauty in women is a treasure rare, which we are never weary of admiring, but a sweet temper is a gift more fair, and the better worth the youthful maid's desiring. That was the boon bestowed on Cinderella by her wise godmother, her truest glory. The rest was not but leather and prunella. Such is the moral of this little story. Beauties that charm becomes you more than dress, and wins a heart with far greater facility. In short, all things to ensure success. The real fairy gift is amiability. Talent, courage, wit, and worth are rare gifts to own on earth. But if you want to thrive at court, so at least the wise report, you will find you need some others, such as godfathers or mothers. End of section 4section five of four and twenty fairy tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by gillian hendry Rique with the tuft by charles perrault translated by james planchet once upon a time there was a queen who was brought to bed of a son so ugly and so ill-shaped that it was for a long time doubtful if he possessed a human form. A fairy who was present at his birth affirmed that he would not fail to be amiable, as he would have much good sense. She added even that he would be able, in consequence of the gift she had endowed him with, to impart equal intelligence to the person he should love best. All this consoled the poor queen a little, who was much distressed at having brought into the world so hideous a little monkey. It is true that the child was no sooner able to speak than he said a thousand pretty things, and that there was in all his actions an indescribable air of intelligence which charmed one. I had forgotten to say that he was born with a little tuft of hair on his head, which occasioned him to be renamed Riquet with the tuft, for Riquet was the family name. At the end of seven or eight years, the queen of a neighbouring kingdom was brought to bed of two daughters. The first that came into the world was fairer than day. The queen was so delighted that it was feared her great joy would prove hurtful to her. The same fairy who had assisted at the birth of little Riquet with the tuft was present upon this occasion, and to moderate the joy of the queen, she declared to her that this little princess would have no mental capacity, and that she would be as stupid as she was beautiful. This mortified the queen exceedingly, but a few minutes afterwards she experienced a very much greater annoyance, for the second girl she gave birth to proved to be extremely ugly. Do not distress yourself so much, madam, said the fairy to her. Your daughter will find compensation. She will have so much sense that her lack of beauty will scarcely be perceived. Heaven send it may be so, replied the queen. But are there no means of giving a little sense to the eldest who is so lovely? I can do nothing for her, madam in the way of wit, said the fairy, but everything in that of beauty. And as there is nothing in my power that I would not do to gratify you, I will endow her with the ability to render beautiful the person who shall please her. As these two princesses grew up, their endowments increased in the same proportion, and nothing was talked of anywhere 
but the beauty of the eldest and the intelligence of the youngest. It is true that their defects also greatly increased with their years. The youngest became uglier every instant, and the eldest more stupid every day. She either made no answer when she was spoken to, or she said something foolish. With this she was so awkward that she could not place four pieces of china on a mantel shelf without breaking one of them, nor drink a glass of water without spilling half of it on her dress. Notwithstanding the great advantage of beauty to a girl, the youngest bore away the palm from her sister nearly always, in every society. At first they gathered round the handsomest, to gaze at and admire her, but they soon left her for the wittiest, to listen to a thousand agreeable things, and people were astonished to find that, in less than a quarter of an hour, the eldest had not a soul near her, and that all the company had formed a circle round the youngest. The former, though very stupid, noticed this, and would have given without regret all her beauty for half the sense of her sister. The queen, discreet as she was, could not help reproaching her frequently with her folly, which made the poor princess ready to die of grief. One day, that she had withdrawn into a wood to bewail her misfortune, she saw a little man approach her, of most disagreeable appearance, but dressed very magnificently. It was the young Prince Rike with the tuft, who, having fallen in love with her from seeing her portraits, which were sent all round the world, had quitted his father's kingdom to have the pleasure of beholding and speaking to her. Enchanted to meet her thus alone, he accosted her with all the respect and politeness imaginable. Having remarked, after paying the usual compliments, that she was very melancholy, he said to her, I cannot comprehend, madam, how a person so beautiful as you are can be so sad as you appear. For though I may boast of having seen an infinity of lovely women, I can avouch that I have never beheld one whose beauty could be compared to yours. You were pleased to say so, sir, replied the princess, and there she stopped. Beauty, continued Riquet, is so great an advantage that it ought to surpass all others, and when one possesses it, I do not see anything that could very much distress you. I had rather, said the princess, be as ugly as you, and have good sense, than possess the beauty I do, and be as stupid as I am. There is no greater proof of good sense, madam, than the belief that we have it not. It is the nature of that gift, that the more we have, the more we believe we are deficient of it. I do not know how that may be, said the princess, but I know well enough that I am very stupid, and that is the cause of the grief which is killing me. If that is all that afflicts you, madam, I can easily put an end to your sorrow. And how would you do that? said the princess. I have the power, madam, said Riquet with the tuft, to give as much wit as any one can possess to the person I love the most. And as you, madam, are that person, it will depend entirely upon yourself whether or not you will have so much wit, provided that you are willing to marry me. The princess was thunderstruck and replied not a word. I see, said Riquet with the tuft, that this proposal pains you, and I am not surprised at it, but I give you a full year to consider of it. The princess had so little sense, and at the same time was so anxious to have a great deal, that she thought the end of that year would never come. So she accepted at once the offer that was made her. She had no sooner promised Riquet with the tuft that she would marry him that day twelve months, than she felt herself to be quite another person to what she was previously. She found she possessed an incredible facility of saying anything she wished, and of saying it in a shrewd yet easy and natural manner. She commenced on the instant, and kept up a sprightly conversation with Riquet with the tuft, during which she chatted away at such a rate that Riquet with the tuft began to believe he had given her more wit than he had kept for himself. When she returned to the palace, the whole court was puzzled to account for a change so sudden and extraordinary, for in proportion to the number of foolish things they had heard her say formerly, were the sensible and exceedingly clever observations she now gave utterance to. All the court was in a state of joy, which is not to be conceived. The younger sister alone was not very much pleased, as no longer possessing over her elder sister the advantage of wit. She now only appeared by her side as a very disagreeable-looking person. The king was now led by his eldest daughter's advice, 
and sometimes even held his council in her apartment. The news of this alteration having spread abroad, all the young princes of the neighbouring kingdoms exerted themselves to obtain her to obtain her affection, and nearly all of them asked her hand in marriage, but she found none of them sufficiently intelligent, and she listened to all of them without engaging herself to any one. At length arrived a prince so rich, so witty, and so handsome, that she could not help feeling an inclination for him. Her father, having perceived it, told her that he left her at perfect liberty to choose a husband for herself, and that she had only to make known her decision. As the more sense we possess, the more difficulty we find in making up one's mind positively on such a matter, she requested, after having thanked her father, that he would allow her some time to think of it. She went by chance to walk in the same wood where she had met with Riki with a tuft, in order to ponder with greater freedom on what she had to do. While she was walking deep in thought, she heard a dull sound beneath her feet, as of many persons running to and fro, and busily occupied. Having listened more attentively, she heard one say, Bring me that saucepan. Another, Give me that kettle. Another, Put some word on the fire. At the same moment, the ground opened, and she saw beneath her what appeared to be a large kitchen, full of cooks, scullions, and all sorts of servants necessary for the preparation of a magnificent banquet. There came forth a band of from twenty to thirty cooks, who went and established themselves in an avenue of the wood at a very long table, and who, each with larding pin in hand and the coup de renard behind the ear, set to work, keeping time to a melodious song. The princess, astonished at this sight, inquired for whom they were working. Madam, replied the most prominent of the troop, for Prince Riquet with the tuft, whose marriage will take place to-morrow. The princess, still more surprised than she was before, and suddenly recollecting that it was just a twelve-month from the day on which she had promised to marry Prince Riquet with the tuft, was lost in amazement. The cause of her not having remembered her promise was that when she made it she was a fool, and on receiving her new mind she forgot all her follies. She had not taken thirty steps in continuation of her walk, when Riquet with the tuft presented himself before her, gaily and magnificently attired, like a prince about to be married. "'You see, madam,' said he, "'I keep my word punctually, "'and I doubt not, but that you have come hither to keep yours, "'and to make me, by the gift of your hand, the happiest of men.' "'I confess to you frankly,' replied the princess, "'that I have not yet made up my mind on that matter, "'and that I do not think I shall ever be able to do so to your satisfaction.' "'You astonish me, madam,' said Riquet with a tuft. "'I have no doubt I do.' said the princess, and assuredly, had I to deal with a stupid person, a man without mind, I should feel greatly embarrassed. A princess is bound by her word, he would say to me, and you must marry me as you have promised to do so. But as the person to whom I speak is the most sensible man in all the world, I am certain he will listen to reason. You know that when I was no better than a fool, I nevertheless could not resolve to marry you. How can you expect now that I have the sense which you have given me, and which renders me much more difficult to please than before, that I should take a resolution to-day, which I could not do then. If you seriously thought of marrying me, you did very wrong to take away my stupidity, and enable me to see clearer than I saw then. If a man without sense, replied Riquet with the tuft, should meet with some indulgence, as you have just intimated, had he to reproach you with your breach of promise, why would you, madam, that I should not be equally so, in a matter which affects the entire happiness of my life? Not be equally so, in a matter which affects the entire happiness of my life. Is it reasonable that persons of intellect should be in a worse condition than those that have none? Can you assert this, you who have so much, and have so earnestly desired to possess it? But let us come to the point, if you please. With the exception of my ugliness, is there anything in me that displeases you? Are you dissatisfied with my birth, my understanding, my temper, or my manners? Not in the least, replied the princess. I admire in you everything you have mentioned. If so, rejoined Riquet with the tuft, I shall be happy, as you have it in your power to make me the most agreeable of men. How can that be done? said the princess. It can be done said Riquet with the tuft, 
if you love me sufficiently to wish that it should be and in order madam that you should have no doubt about it know that the same fairy who on the day i was born endowed me with the power to give understanding to the person i chose gave you also the power to render handsome the man you should love and on whom you were desirous to bestow that favour if such be the fact said the princess i wish with all my heart that you should become the handsomest prince in the world and i bestow the gift on you to the fullest extent in my power the princess had no sooner pronounced these words than riquet with the tuft appeared to her eyes of all men in the world the handsomest the best made and the most amiable she had ever seen there are some who assert that it was not the spell of the fairy but love alone that caused the metamorphosis they say that the princess having reflected on all the perseverance of her lover on his prudence and all the good qualities of his heart and mind no longer saw the deformity of his body nor the ugliness of his features that his hunch appeared to her nothing more than the effect of a man shrugging his shoulders and that instead of observing as she had done that he limped horribly she saw in him no more than a certain lounging air which charmed her they say also that his eyes which squinted seemed to her only more brilliant from that defect which passed in her mind for a proof of the intensity of his love and in fine that his great red nose had in it something martial and heroic however this may be the princess promised on the spot to marry him provided he obtained the consent of the king her father the king having learned that his daughter entertained a great regard for riquet with the tuft whom he knew also to be a very clever and wise prince accepted him with pleasure for a son-in-law the wedding took place the next morning as riquet with the tuft had foreseen and according to the instructions which he had given a long time before no beauty no talent has power above some indefinite charm discerned only by love end of section five Section 6 of Four and Twenty Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Veronica Cerny. Little Thumbling by Charles Perrault. Translated by James Planchet. Once upon a time, there was a woodcutter and his wife who had seven children, all boys. The eldest was but ten years old, and the youngest only seven. People wondered that the woodcutter had had so many children in so short a time. But the fact is that his wife not only had them very fast, but seldom presented him with less than two at a birth. They were very poor, and their seven children troubled them greatly, as not one of them was yet able to gain his livelihood. What grieved them still more was that the youngest was very delicate, and seldom spoke which they considered a proof of stupidity instead of good sense. He was very diminutive, and when first born scarcely bigger than one's thumb, which caused them to call him Little Thumbling. This poor child was the scapegoat of the house and was blamed for everything that happened. Nevertheless, he was the shrewdest and most sensible of all his brothers, and if he spoke little, he listened a great deal. There came a very bad harvest, and the famine was so severe that these poor people determined to get rid of their children. One evening, when they were all in bed, and the woodman was sitting over the fire with his wife, he said to her with an aching heart, "'Thou seest clearly that we can no longer find food for our children. I cannot let them die of hunger before my eyes, and I am resolved to lose them to-morrow in the wood, which will be easily done, for whilst they are occupied in tying up the faggots, we have but to make off unobserved by them ah oh, exclaimed the woodcutter's wife canst thou have the heart to lose thine own children her husband in vain represented to her their exceeding poverty she could not consent to the deed she was poor but she was their mother having however reflected on the misery it would occasion her to see them die of hunger she at length assented and went to bed weeping little thumbling heard everything they had said for having ascertained, as he lay in his bed, that they were talking of their affairs, he got up quietly and slipped under his father's stool to listen without being seen. He went to bed again and slept not a wink for the rest of the night, thinking what he should do. He rose early and repaired to the banks of a rivulet, where he filled his pockets with small white pebbles and then returned home. 
They set out all together, and Little Thumbling said nothing of what he had heard to his brothers. They entered a very thick forest, wherein, at ten paces distant, they could not see one another. The woodcutter began to cut wood, and his children to pick up sticks to make faggots with. The father and mother, seeing them occupied with their work, stole away gradually, and then fled suddenly by a small winding path. When the children found themselves all alone, they began to scream and cry with all their might. Little Thumbling let them scream, well knowing how he could get home again, for as he came he had dropped along the road the little white pebbles he had in his pockets. He said to them then, Fear nothing, brothers. My father and mother have left us here, but I will take you safely home. Only follow me. They followed him, and he led them back to the house by the same road that they had taken into the forest. They feared to enter immediately, but placed themselves close to the door to listen to the conversation of their father and mother. Just at the moment when the woodcutter and his wife arrived at home, the lord of the manor sent them ten crowns which he had owed them a long time, and which they had given up all hope of receiving. This was new life to them, for these poor people were actually starving. The woodcutter sent his wife to the butchers immediately. As it was many a day since they had tasted meat, she bought three times as much as was necessary for the supper of two persons. When they had satisfied their hunger, the woodcutter's wife said, Alas, where now are our poor children? They would fare merrily on what we have left. But it was thou, Guillaume, who wouldst lose them. Truly did I say we should repent it. Oh, what are they now doing in the forest? Alas, heaven help me! The wolves have, perhaps, already devoured them. Inhuman that thou art thus to have destroyed thy children! The woodcutter began to lose his temper, for she repeated more than twenty times that they should repent it, and that she had said they would. He threatened to beat her if she did not hold her tongue. It was not that the woodcutter was not, perhaps, even more sorry than his wife, but that she made such a noise about it, and that he was like many other men who are very fond of women who can talk well, but are exceedingly annoyed by those whose words always come true. The wife was all in tears. Alas, where are now my children, my poor children? She uttered this at length so loudly that the children who were at the door heard her and began to cry all together, We are here, we are here! She ran quickly to open the door to them, and embracing them exclaimed, How happy I am to see you again, my dear children! You are very tired and hungry. And how dirty thou art, Piero! Come here and let me wash thee. Piero was her eldest son, and she loved him better than all the rest, because he was rather red-headed, and she was slightly so herself. They sat down to supper, and ate with an appetite that delighted their father and mother, to whom they related how frightened they were in the forest, speaking almost always all together. The good folks were enchanted to see their children once more around them, and their joy lasted as long as the ten crowns. But when the money was spent, they relapsed into their former misery, and resolved to lose the children again. And to do so effectually, they determined to lead them much further from home than they had done the first time. They could not talk of this so privately, but that they were overheard by little Thumbling, who reckoned upon getting out of the scrape by the same means as before. But though he got up very early to collect the little pebbles, he could not succeed in his object, for he found the house door double locked. He knew not what to do, when the woodcutter's wife, having given them each a piece of bread for their breakfast, it occurred to him that he might make the bread supply the place of the pebbles, by strewing crumbs of it along the path as they went, and so he put his piece in his pocket. The father and mother led them into the thickest and darkest part of the forest, and as soon as they had done so, they gained a by-path and left them there. Little Thumbling did not trouble himself much, for he believed he should easily find his way back by means of the bread which he had scattered wherever he had passed. But he was greatly surprised at not being able to find a single crumb. The birds had eaten it all up. Behold the poor children then in great distress, for the further they wandered, the deeper they plunged into the forest. Night came on, and a great wind arose, which terrified them horribly. They fancied they heard on every side nothing but the howling of wolves hastening to devour them. They scarcely dared to speak or look behind them. It then began to rain so heavily that they were soon drenched to the skin. They slipped every step, tumbling into the mud, 
out of which they scrambled in a filthy state, not knowing what to do with their little hands. Little Thumbling climbed up a tree to try if he could see anything from the top of it. Having looked all about him, he saw a little light, like that of a candle, but it was a long way on the other side of the forest. He came down again, and when they had reached the ground, he could see the light no longer. This distressed him greatly, but having walked on with his brothers for some time in the direction of the light, he saw it again on emerging from the wood. At length they reached the house where the light was, not without many alarms, for they often lost sight of it, and always when they descended into the valleys. They knocked loudly at the door, and a good woman came to open it. She asked them what they wanted. Little Thumbling told her they were poor children who had lost their way in the forest, and who begged a night's lodging for charity. The woman, seeing they were all so pretty, began to weep, and said to them, Alas, my poor children, whither have you come? Know that this is the dwelling of an ogre, who eats little boys. Alas, madam, replied Little Thumbling, who trembled from head to foot, as did all his brothers, what shall we do? It is certain that the wolves of the forest will not fail to devour us to-night, if you refuse to receive us under your roof. And that being the case, we had rather be eaten by the gentleman. Perhaps he may have pity upon us, if you are kind enough to ask him. The ogre's wife, who fancied she could contrive to hide them from her husband till the next morning, allowed them to come in, and led them where they could warm themselves by a good fire, for there was a whole sheep on the spit roasting for the ogre's supper. Just as they were beginning to get warm, they heard two or three loud knocks on the door. It was the ogre who had come home. His wife immediately made the children hide under the bed, and went to open the door. The ogre first asked if his supper was ready, and if she had drawn the wine, and with that he sat down to his meal. The mutton was all but raw, but he liked it all the better for that. He sniffed right and left, saying that he smelt fresh meat. "'Oh, it must be the calf I have just skinned that you smell,' said his wife. "'I smell fresh meat!' "'I tell you once more,' replied the ogre, looking askance at his wife. "'There is something here that I don't understand.' In saying these words, he rose from the table and went straight to the bed. "'Ah!' he exclaimed. "'It is thus, then, thou wouldst deceive me, cursed woman!' I know not what hinders me from eating thee also. It is well for thee that thou art an old beast. Here is some game which comes in good time for me to entertain three ogres of my acquaintance, who are coming to see me in a day or two. He dragged them from under the bed, one after the other. The poor children fell on their knees, begging mercy, but they had to deal with the most cruel of all the ogres, and who, far from feeling pity for them, devoured them already with his eyes, and said to his wife, they would be dainty bits when she had made a good sauce for them. He went to fetch a great knife, and as he returned to the poor children, he wetted it on a long stone that he held in his left hand. He had already seized one when his wife said to him, What would you do at this hour of the night? Will it not be time enough to-morrow? Hold thy peace, replied the ogre. They will be the more tender. But you all have already so much meat, returned his wife. Here is a calf. Two sheep and half a pig. "'Thou art right,' said the ogre. "'Give them a good supper, that they may not fall away, and then put them to bed.' The good woman was enchanted, and brought them plenty for supper, but they couldn't eat. They were so paralyzed with fright. As for the ogre, he seated himself to drink again, delighted to think he had such a treat in store for his friends. He drained a dozen goblets, more than usual, which affected his head a little and obliged him to go to bed. The ogre had seven daughters who were still in their infancy. These little ogresses had the most beautiful complexions, in consequence of their eating raw flesh like their father. But they had very small, round, gray eyes, hooked noses, and very large mouths, with long teeth, exceedingly sharp and wide apart. They were not very vicious as yet, but they promised fairly to be so for they already began to bite little children in order to suck their blood. They had been sent to bed early, and were all seven in a large bed, having each a crown of gold on her head. In the same room was another bed of the same size. It was in this bed that the ogre's wife put the seven little boys to sleep, after which she went to sleep with her husband. Little Thumbling, 
who had remarked that the ogre's daughters had golden crowns on their heads and who feared that the ogre might regret that he had not killed him and his brothers that evening got up in the middle of the night and taking off his own nightcap and those of his brothers went very softly and placed them on the heads of the ogre's seven daughters after having taken off their golden crowns which he put on his brothers and himself in order that the ogre might mistake them for his daughters and his daughters for the boys whose throats he longed to cut matters turned out exactly as he anticipated for the ogre awaking at midnight regretting having deferred till the morning that he might have done the evening before he therefore jumped suddenly out of bed and seizing his great knife let us go said he and see how our young rogues are by this time we won't make two bites at a cherry therewith he stole on tiptoes up to his daughter's bedroom and approached the bed in which lay the little boys who were all asleep except thumbling who was dreadfully frightened when the ogre placed his hand upon his head to feel it as he had in turn felt those of all his brothers the ogre who felt the golden crown said truly i was about to do a pretty job it's clear i must have drunk too much last night he then went to the bed where his daughter slept and having felt the little nightcaps that belonged to the boys aha cried he here are our young wags let us to work boldly so saying he cut without hesitation the throats of his seven daughters well satisfied with this exploit he returned and stretched himself beside his wife as soon as little thumbling heard the ogre snoring he woke his brothers and bade them dress themselves quickly and follow him they went down softly into the garden and jumped over the wall they ran nearly all night long trembling all the way and not knowing whither they were going the ogre awakening in the morning said to his wife get thee upstairs and dress the little rogues you took in last night the ogress was astonished at the kindness of her husband never suspecting the sort of dressing he meant her to give them and fancying he ordered her to go out and put on their clothes she went upstairs where she was greatly surprised to find her daughters murdered and swimming in their blood the first thing she did was to faint for it is the first thing that almost all women do in similar circumstances the ogre fearing that his wife would be too long about the job he had given her to do went upstairs to help her he was not less surprised than his wife when he beheld this frightful spectacle ha ah, what have i done he exclaimed the wretches shall pay for it and instantly he then threw a jugful of water in his wife's face and having brought her to said quick give me my seven league boots that i may go and catch them he set out and after running in every direction came at last upon the track of the poor children who were not more than a hundred yards from their father's house they saw the ogre striding from hill to hill and who stepped over rivers as easily as if they were the smallest brooks little thumbling who perceived a hollow rock close by where they were hid his brothers in it and crept in after them watching all the while the progress of the ogre the ogre feeling very tired with his long journey to no purpose for seven league boots are very fatiguing to wear was inclined to rest and by chance sat down on the very rock in which the little boys had concealed themselves as he was quite worn out he had not rested long before he fell asleep and began to snore so dreadfully that the poor children were not less frightened than they were when he took up the great knife to cut their throats little thumbling was not so much alarmed and told his brothers to run quickly into the house while the ogre was sound asleep and not to be uneasy about him they took his advice and speedily reached home little thumbling having approached the ogre gently pulled off his boots and put them on directly the boots were very large and very long but as they were fairy boots they possessed the quality of increasing or diminishing in size according to the leg of the person who wore them so that they fitted him as perfectly as if they had been made for him he went straight to the ogre's house where he found his wife weeping over her murdered daughters your husband said little thumbling to her is in great danger for he has been seized by a band of robbers who have sworn to kill him if he does not give them all his gold and silver at the moment they had their daggers at his throat he perceived me and entreated me to come and tell you the situation he was in and bid you give me all his ready cash without keeping back any of it as otherwise they will kill him without mercy as time pressed he insisted i should take his seven league boots which you see i have on 
in order that I might make haste, and also that you might be sure I was not imposing upon you. The good woman, very much alarmed, immediately gave him all the money she could find, for the ogre was not a bad husband to her, although he ate little children. Little Thumbling, thus laden with all the wealth of the ogre, hastened back to his father's house, where he was received with great joy. There are many persons who differ in their account of this part of the story, and who pretend that Little Thumbling never committed this robbery, and that he only considered himself justified in taking the ogre's seven-league boots, because he used them expressly to run after little children. These people assert that they have heard it from good authority, and that they have eaten and drunk in the woodcutter's house. They assure us that when Little Thumbling had put on the ogre's boots, he went to court, where he knew they were in much trouble about an army which was within two hundred leagues of them, and anxious to learn the success of a battle that had been fought. They say he went to seek the king, and told him that if he desired it he would bring him back news of the army before the end of the day. The king promised him a large sum of money if he did so. Little Thumbling brought news that very evening, and this first journey had made him known he got whatever he chose to ask, for the king paid most liberally for taking his orders to the army, and numberless ladies gave him anything he chose for news of their lovers, and they were his best customers. He occasionally met with some wives who entrusted him with letters for their husbands, but they paid him so poorly, and the amount was altogether so trifling, that he did not condescend to put down amongst his receipts what he got for that service. After he had been a courier for some time, and saved a great deal of money, he returned to his father, where it is impossible to imagine the joy of his family at seeing him again. He made them all comfortable. He bought newly made offices for his father and his brothers, and by these means established them all, making his own way at court at the same time. Often is the handsome boy made alone his father's joy, while the tiny, timid child is neglected or reviled. Notwithstanding, sometimes he lives of all the prop to be. End of section 6 Recording by Veronica Cerny